All right, I guess uh, we can start now. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome. My name is Sahdev Zala, and I work at IBM. Um, just a little bit in context of this talk. Um, I'm so proud to be working on open source for, you know, uh, for, for over a decade. Uh, currently, I contribute to PyTorch, and I also contribute to Kubernetes. And previously, I was uh, tackled in OpenStack and uh, OSS Tosca projects. Um, you know, today I want to just uh, uh, go with some basics about deep learning uh, and PyTorch, and then I want to show the capabilities that PyTorch project provides for, you know, model training and you know model building. And I know this is a this is a you know session for beginners, so I want to cover you know, a lot of basics here. But I do want to touch a couple of the advanced topics that's happening in PyTorch. Uh, hopefully, you'll find them you know uh, educational, and then. I will be, you know, talking and showing some of the si open source side of the project. You know how you can contribute to the project if you want, and you know what's going on uh, with some of the latest development. All right, so let's start with some basics. Uh, you know that technology world is uh, it's full of jargons. You know AI, same thing. You know there are a lot of terminologies, and uh, I. Definitely cannot cover everything here, but I want to. I want to just at least cover a few terminologies. You know, so if you are new to the PyTorch, new to the deep learning, you know, you get an idea before we we talk. Uh, you know more. So I will start with deep learning. How many? I'm sure we we all been hearing about deep learning and you know neural network and stuff. And I guess uh, you probably are using. How many of think you use deep learning based offerings today? I guess all of us, right? Yeah. So it's like it has become, you know, mainstream, right? All right. So let's start with uh, deep learning. And I was just talking to, to, you know, uh, to her uh, uh, that hey, because of my reading glasses, I only noticed it today that uh, you know the dependency on your reading glasses. But anyway, so um, it's hard for me to read here, so that's better, I guess. So deep learning, uh, it's basically uh, using the neural network, and you know I will use the word model, uh, you know instead of neural network. People uh, obviously, you know, many times they they have this question like, okay, but what is model? That's your neural network. Okay. Um, so it's use of neural network, uh, you know, with with multiple layers, right? So that's the key here for deep learning. Uh, if it, if it doesn't have like at least two layers, then you can consider that model as in like a shallow learning model. So you know at least two hidden layers in the model, and uh, it's basically trained using large amount of data. So we know we have fortunately lots of data these days, and and that's what made it possible to the deep learning right, uh, which wasn't possible a few years back. So like data technologies like PyTorch, you know, uh, and and those kind of advancement has made deep learning mainstream. And there are a lot of use cases, right? Code generations, content generations, uh, you know, summarizing documentations, right? The, the bots that we deal with, if you go online, something pop up, right? Like, hey, ask me questions. There are like QA bots and whatnot. So those are all use cases of deep learning. And you know, the applications are, are, are real. I think we're barely scratching the surface, you know, in many industries, right? You know, whether it's, it's like your, your car on autopilot mode or, Using some of this speech recognizer at home. So, and as you see in the diagram, you know, uh, uh, that's it. with the two hidden layers, you know, the nodes there. Um, it's basically, you know, you see the graph, right, with nodes and uh, edges. So the nodes, we, you know, we can call it either node or unit or a neuron. Okay, and on the side, I give like a breakdown of the neuron on the on the on the right side. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but second, let me talk about tensor. So you know, a fancy word if you are new to the uh, you know deep learning. Um, but tensor is basically nothing but uh, uh, a multi-dimensional and dimensional arrays, and those arrays you know um, are used for numerical computation. So deep learning is full of all this computation. You know, just number computation. That's what it does, you know. and it gets complex with more and more layers. Bless you. And PyTorch, uh, uh, you know, in PyTorch, tensors is basically the primary data structure. So, you know, things you see in this, in this diagram, you know, uh, the labels, those are all represented as in some numerical value 
as in tensor. Okay. Next thing, model parameters. So I'm sure you you know we hear about all these model, right? Chat GPT and other models, and you're like, hey, oh the Mistral 7B came out, Granite 13B out, you know. So all these 7B is like 7 billion parameters, 13B is like 13 billion parameters, and you can you know you can count them here in this uh, this is small small diagram I have right. So it's basically uh, the weights and biases is what that 13 billion or you know what your billion uh, parameters uh, refers to, right? So here it's like uh, three input nodes, and then you know the first layer is four, so like three times four is like 12. So you have like 12 weights, okay? And you can just continue counting that, right? And each neuron has something I have over there, like as in B, that's a bias. So you add the bias, and you know you get this this number where you call it that many number of parameters in the model. Um, also in that uh, that that you know right side uh, breakdown of neuron, so that's one neuron, and as you see, it's a function. Okay, so the neurons are basically a function which will take some 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 values. In this case, uh, this is basically an example of uh, that's what I'm going to use like a classification image image recognizer image classifier, right? So here it takes like a three input. Every edge has some weight, as you see, right? W one, two, three. So it's like x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2. As you see, it's basically the weighted sum. That's what it is. And plus the bias. So that's your function. You know, some, some math involved, or you know, a lot of math in, in a way, like calculus, linear algebra kind of things, right? But it's basically the classic you know, z equal to wx plus b, or y equal to wx plus b, right? And then the second thing you notice within the same neuron as like second step, that's the activation function. We'll talk more about that, but there are multiple functions available. But that will produce some output, and that output will be an input to the next neuron for the next layer, okay? And that's a, here like it's only two, two, layer, two hidden layers, but with this larger models, you will see several layers and, and several neurons, right? Instead of four, you can have like maybe 1,000, you know, maybe 500, you know, all right? Um, then forward pass. So we're going to talk about forward feed neural network, right? Uh, uh, so forward pass is basically, basically it just says you go forward in that ne in your network, right? You start with the input, you keep going. At the end, you have some output. And in PyTorch, you know, when first forward pass, all the weights and biases are assigned randomly. So you know, first forward pass. At the end of the uh, end of your your pass, you know you get some output which obviously won't be the output that you are looking, but that's where the backward pass comes in picture or backward propagations, and that's where the learning happens. Okay, so that's where you know we we tweak these parameters based on you know loss and other things which will uh, which I'll talk in a little bit, but we optimize or tweak these weights and biases to produce an output that we want. Okay, and so that's the whole learning process. You know. And as I said, it's all numbers, you know, all tensors, okay? All right, so PyTorch, we talk about deep learning because PyTorch is a deep learning framework. And it provides you all the building blocks and, uh, you know, the uh, functions that you need to create a, a, a model, to create a neural network of your choice, right, of what you need, and then train it. Um, like I said, there are a lot of math, like, algorithms behind it and and few years back you know it was like this deep learning was sort of topic of research you know like mainstream we were talking it but you know like say technology like python which implements this algorithm for you so you really don't need to worry about those algorithm you know implementation or anything you just call the functions that are already been implemented for you so those are the building blocks are out there the second thing is with this larger models you know we're talking i guess we're hearing a lot about gpus right and the GPU manufacturers, you know. So this training for larger models is top, it's not possible without leveraging the power of GPU, which can, uh, you know, you cannot do with CPU only. Like smaller models, of course, you can use CPU for computation, but because of all this parallel computing need, you're gonna use GPUs for larger models. So PyTorch, you know, that's another great feature of PyTorch. It supports CPU, GPU, parallel on like a single machine with multiple GPUs. Or you know, for these LLMs, right, large language models and others, you basically training, uh, you will be training your model on on like a cluster, multiple machines with multiple GPUs, right? And 
that can be like thousands of GPUs, you know, let me tell you, right? And it, the training can take like months or years, depending on the model size, okay? Um, Python is the primary interface that PyTorch uh, provides, so that's great, you know, in, in the AI field, probably everybody knows Python, you know. So you can use Python uh, to create your model and you know, we'll, we'll see that as an example. Um, and you know, train and everything, but C++ is also supported. You can do the same thing as you can do in Python with C++ if you need, you know, and definitely it can give you a little bit of better performance, but Python is more commonly used interface. Easy to install, somebody actually asked me a question just before this talk outside in hallway, one of the old friend in Kubernetes and, you know, <clears throat> there are multiple ways, but I would say, you know, using Conda or Peep, it's very quick to install. Um, and if you are a developer who wants to contribute to the PyTorch, you basically just git clone the PyTorch repo, get the source code, and you need to make certain prerequisites, you know, mainly around uh, the, the, the GPU support. And, uh, but there's a good documentation available. The next thing I wanna talk is, you know, the reason we are here, the reason my talk here was accepted is because PyTorch is an open source project, right? It came out of, uh, came out of Meta, uh, you know, a few years back. Uh, and in uh, 2022, uh, I think towards the uh, second half, the PyTorch Foundation was formed and PyTorch was officially moved you know, as a foundation project. And PyTorch Foundation is part of Linux Foundation, so we know that there's a, you know open governance. There's a dynamic community. You know there are I would say at least 3,000 uh, plus contributors, right? So uh, it's, it's it's great. Um, the one of the other thing which has made PyTorch like a de facto framework for deep learning, as you see in the research, you know in commercial use, is it's easy to start with. Okay. I mean, you, once you install it, it's literally, it will take you, you know, like an hour or so. I mean, if you know a little bit about Python, you know, just to, to, to create like some Hello World kind of model and, you know, just test it, right? Um, so there are two modes, uh, something called eager mode that basically will, uh, you know, will execute your code right away. So like any operations, you know, addition, multiplication, whatever, right, on your variables, that happens right away. So that helps debugging, debugging your code. Like you write something, you print something, you know, but then in commercial use case, uh, you know, or usage, uh, you basically will use graph mode, you know, to optimize uh, uh, the compiler level uh, stuff, you know, to, for the performance. We'll talk about that, you know, I, I have that as one of the advanced uh, feature of PyTorch. And it supports many libraries, you know, uh, there's a, uh, PyTorch is the, there's a code library and there's libraries for like, you know, different domains, region, uh, text, right, uh, for uh, edge devices, you know, mobiles and others. And there's also a tool called Torch Bench, which I had contributed myself, and it's a pretty good tool to see the benchmarking. Uh, they publish uh, benchmarking results, uh, you know, publicly, so it's available if you uh, want to take a look. So I have some code snippet, uh, snippets here. I know the, the, we have a mix of uh, audience here, developers and, you know, users, and so I will, I will not go too, too deep into it, but uh, if I, we have time, I'll show a little demo at the end of the talk. But I mentioned about that flow, right? Building models, training it and all that. Now, first thing is, you know, you need data, right? So let's say you have data sets that's been curated, you, it's available. So the first thing you just wanna make sure that you have this thing prepared for your model, okay? And it's, you can do it writing your own code, but the Python, uh, PyTorch provides uh, utilities, uh, two utilities, mainly data loader and data sets. So, you know, it will take care of, uh, you know, a lot of things for you, like, you know, pulling, as you see in the snippet, right? You just download the Amnist database that we, I'm using as an example. Um, and, you know, it will convert two tensors, which is required. All you do is like, hey, two tensor, yes. Uh, you can, you know, it's highly recommended that you split your data as in test data and training data, okay? So you wanna keep your test data separate so that when you test it, your model basically, you know, it's not exposed to those data at that point, right? So you, you get a better idea about your model performance, okay? Um, so you can specify that as well. You know, one of my favorite is, I'm sure like, you know, my kids, are my, I have two boys, you know, they, they have asked me and I have and maybe as a kid myself, like, you know, they're like, hey, daddy, can you quiz me? Because I have quiz in school, you know, there's 20 questions, but like, oh, don't ask me in that order. Otherwise I will just remember the order. And if they ask me something, you know, shuffling, then I won't be able to answer, right? Because you just memorize. Same thing with the model. 
you don't want to provide data in like a particular order, right? So you want to sh shuffle it. This utilities will shuffle that for you, and you know it makes life easy, right? All right, let's come to this model building part. So um, as I mentioned, model is basically built of layers, right? Multiple layers, uh, and it's basically made of functions, okay? So PyTorch has this uh, package called torch.nn that is basically uh, you know, inherited in your model if you're creating one, as you can see in this snippet. Uh, use that package for, for different layers, like linear layer I just showed for as an example, but you know, convolutions or recurrent for like sequencing, right, where we see the you know, auto-filling on your phone or you know, with texting we do, right? Uh, more recently, it's, it's transformer. That's, those are very popular uh, these days. And it provides built-in activation functions like ReLU or you know, Sigmoid or Softmax. Um, and uh, PyTorch, again, has like built-in loss functions. As I said, a lot of things are provided to you, right? So you just need to call them as part of your, you know, uh, your, your, your own architecture, how you want to create your model. But uh, this loss function basically, you know, as, it's, as you can figure out, right, the loss from what you get as an output versus what you would expect it to be, right? So if you, like, hey, I fit number one here, I expect number one, but I get some, you know, prediction like, oh, that's like low probability, then the, the loss is higher. And the goal in training is basically you want to minimize this loss, right, as much as possible. And once you have this loss calculated, uh, you know, there are multiple f loss functions like min square error, MSE, or cross entropy loss, and you know, uh, others depending on the use case. But then the next step is to optimize uh, your, again, your weights and biases, right? That's very important, the parameters, right? You want to tweak that. So using this loss, you, uh, you calculate something called gradient. And gradient is basically just tells you the change that happens in your function with change, ha change to your variables, right? So if you tweak this parameter, what happens to your, you know, the output of your loss function, okay? So using this gradient and something called learning rate, that's something you define, right? So it will basically, you know, it will, it will move according to this learning rate, like, you know, how far you want to go, right? Like, you know, if, if, like say, as an example, you have like, one is your loss and your, you know, your learning rate is like 0.5, then it knows like, okay, I want to move 0.5 higher or lower, you know, including with uh, some multiplication with gradient. Typically, the learning rate is not that big, you know, that was just an example. Typically, you keep it a little smaller, not too small either, because otherwise it will take too long to learn, right? Because you, it's like you lost and you take very, a baby step, then it will take long versus you go, so you have to adjust a little bit there. But then, you know, you, 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 uh, change these model parameters using these optimizers, and then again you run that forward pass, right? It's like you keep doing it. At one point you will see that converge, like, oh, you know, my loss is now really, you know, in something that I can trust now, you know, right? So uh, next, model training, right? I think that's one of the things everybody's interested. And so the training loop, as you see here, it's, it's actually simple. Again, my example is simple as well, but you know, this, this, the same fundamentals applies to even, I would say, more complicated uh, models as well. So training loop, as you can see, um, uh, you, know, you provide this input data as in like a batch. So you know, uh, in that, uh, the data loader utility that I mentioned, that will provide the, as per the batch, according to the size that you define. Usually it's a multiple of eight, you know, that we use for, uh, for, for the batch size, right? And then uh, you, you basically run the forward pass and you get some predictions. And then as I was saying that, right, you, you find the loss. Here I, I'm using the cross entropy loss. Um, and then you calculate the gradient. There is a feature called auto gradient PyTorch that I think one of the most popular feature that, that made uh, PyTorch really, you know, uh, being heavily used in research in early days, right, uh, and now in production as well. But this auto grid features helps you calculate the gradient. That, you know, it's fundamental in calculus. So if you rebrush your high school math, calculus, you know, there's something called derivatives, right, and, and then, you know, this, uh, the sum of that will basically give you the gradient. But, you know, there's a, something called chain rule. If you do manually on, like, just few parameters, yes, you can do. But when you talk about this billions of parameters, you know, 
you really cannot uh, do by yourself. But luckily, PyTorch provides you that auto grid feature, which, you know, as it says, it will calculate the gradient for you automatically. All you do is you call that uh, backward function there, right? So the backward will calculate the things for you. And you know, once you find that, um, uh, you, know, you, you use the optimizer, and at the end of the loop, you set your gradients to zero so that you're ready for the next batch, OK? So you run this thing for number of epochs. It's another term they use heavily you know, in, in machine learning, right? I mean, people do get like, oh, what's iteration? You know, it's basically iterations. But epoch, you, know, you can say the little difference is if, you're, if your input data, the data set is only 64 and your batch size is 64, then you know, it's one epoch, one iteration. But you know, if you're like 60,000 input and 64 batch, it's a lot of iterations, right? But it's one epoch when you, when you uh, feed all your 60,000 data in, in a batch, right? So typically, like, you know, five epochs, or it can be like a big number depending on the model. Uh, but you run this for a number of epochs, and at the, like I said, after one or two, you will see that the loss is getting lower. You, your, your output is becoming something what you want. And there's one thing I haven't put in my slide, but something called uh, checkpoint, OK? So checkpoint is, is it's great because it, you know, in a simple way, you can think as in like a snapshot. Right? So you run the epoch. Now, I just mentioned 60,000 data, but with those you know, LLMs, it can be huge data set. Right? And if your training loop, your one epoch can take like weeks or hours or days, and something goes wrong with your machine, you don't want to start from beginning. right? That will be painful. Okay, so you can use this checkpoint to snapshot at the end of the epoch, and or if something goes wrong, you can actually restart from that snapshot. You know, like we do with the VMs and you know whatnot, right? And other thing is, you know, you run like every epoch. You, let's say you have five checkpoints, and then you can even actually compare like which one is the best. You know, and sometimes like you know what? Let me throw the last one. Let me use the fourth one. So it's it's more like in you know traditional software engineering like your release candidates, right? You have like multiple release candidate, and you're like, no, this is the one we want to go with, OK? Um, so then, you know, th this is a very simple step. So once you train it, it you think, hey, you're ready for uh, testing. So that's why you use those test data that I mentioned earlier. You basically, uh, <clears throat> you know, run this uh, uh, validation uh, to check the correctness, right? The two things you don't do here is you don't run the backward pass. Because validation is more like in what you do uh, you know, in real life for inferencing, prediction, right? So you just do the forward pass and see what's your output. Is that something makes you happy? You know, like, oh, this is great. You know, this is what I want, right, on my test data. Um, then, you, you know, then you pretty much, you know, like, hey, I want to save this model. You, can, you just save the model uh, as in Python, uh, PyTorch file. And at that point, you know, you, you can take this model and, you know, deploy it or, you know, you, you try it for own own way to, to do run some, like, you know, real uh, test, real data, right? And that, that uh, the one thing requires is, you know, I mentioned you the, the load, loading your saved model, right? Because many times people do get confused that, oh, my model is there, I just run it. But no, you need to, you need to load it because when you save the model, it's, it saves nothing but a state you know, it's a dictionary with your parameters. So you instantiate this model, you create the instance, and then you load that dictionary. So, you know, all the parameters that you train, you will be using at that point. Okay, and then you make prediction as, you know, with very same step as I mentioned in my validation. So I did not put it, you know, just to keep it not too crowded. Okay, so that's, that's, that is basically the, the flow. Um, uh, like it, it seems, Pretty simple, right? And it is uh, complex model. Yes, it's it's a lot more work, uh, but like I said, to get you started on PyTorch, it doesn't take too long. You know, as long as you know some Python, uh, you have some you know those conceptual knowledge of uh, some of these AI ML things, a little bit of math, then you, you're good to go, right? The other thing I want to mention is distributed training. As I mentioned, you know, in in real life. You will need to do the distributed training, right? You're not gonna, you know, just train on your laptop. You know, again, depending on your model size, but for the bigger models. So PyTorch again provides a lot of good things here, making your life easy. There are mainly three things here: uh, uh, data parallel, that's very easy. 
way to use the distributed uh, feature provided by PyTorch. All right, it basically creates a process and it uses multi-threading depending the number of GPUs that you have on your machine, right? So typically you use it on like a single machine with multiple GPUs. It's not so highly, it's not recommended really because of the, the threading problems in Python. Okay, there's locking problems. Also, it's slow. It's easy to use, like I mentioned, just one line of code. All you do is you call this data parallel, you, you, know, you, you provide your model as an argument, and then PyTorch will do the rest of the work. You don't do anything with the threading. You, know, you don't have to deal with it. Right? But like I said, it's slow. So what's popular is called DDP, or distributed data parallel. Why? It, it's not about threading. It basically creates processes for your, GP, uh, for your machines, right? for the GPUs. And you can have a cluster of machines with multiple GPUs. And what it does, it, it will replicate your model per GPU and you know, it makes training faster, or more you know, higher performance by splitting the, the data across these GPUs. Okay? Because again, we, this is useful when you're talking about large data sets, right? So, and then PyTorch will synchronize between, among this cluster. So there'll be like something called like a main node or master node and then other worker nodes. The main node will be the one which will be synchronizing and end of like a training of a particular batch. Will, you know, it, will, it will think and run the next one across all these GPUs, right? So that, that, that's huge you know, from a performance perspective. Um, but the way, I mean, it, the technology, we always have challenges. We always want more, right? So the models are getting bigger, right? What if your model cannot fit on a single GPU? Well, what do you do, <laughs> right? So just splitting the, tra the data, the, tra the training data, it won't help you at that point. What you need is you want to split your model itself, right? So there's, that's where the next, next paradigm is like FSDP or fully sharded data parallel. And it basically shards your model itself with the gradient that I mentioned because it's all in the memory, right? With the state of your optimizers. So we'll split across the GPUs. Again, the FSDP will do the heavy loading for you of synchronizing all the things. And uh, you know, at IBM, I mean, we, we love it. We have folks working on it. We contributed to the uh, PyTorch uh, project as well. Uh, I think we, we also had some blogs out there, but you know, we showed uh, uh, with PyTorch team. So that's a lot of meta folks, of course, right? Um, uh, as of today, because still the foundation is still new and Matt has a lot of expertise there, but uh, we work with them and we had this, uh, you know, just, just demoing things on like 64 nodes with like 500 plus GPUs using FSDB. The performance uh, was really good. Uh, if you, you know, I th just look at the, I think a simple Google search will give you the blog. The second thing I want to mention is the uh, compiler side of the PyTorch. This is really uh, something you should know if you don't already know, torch.compile. That was the, one of the main feature in uh, PyTorch 2.0, you know, justifying the major release you know, because of this work. So this is where I mentioned the graph mode in my, you know, one of the beginning slides, right? Eager mode and graph mode. So here, uh, the, you know, and PyTorch was supporting it with torch.compile. It just made it a lot better you know, from the pers uh, performance perspective, from uh, usability, you know, it's written in Python, so people can contribute more versus earlier a lot of C++ code, which, which are difficult to contribute by many people. So there are two things, Torch Dynamo and Torch Inductor. Torch Dynamo basically uh, creates a graph for you, something they call FX graph, and, you know, uh, optimize it. And then Torch Inductor will take it to the next level of optimizations, right, to run on your, on your hardware. Um, and, and the performance, I think there is really good 30% uh, or more performance improvements you know, on like inferencing side. You can use this as part of your training as well. Uh, and as I mentioned here, what it does is it generates this optimized code, right? As part of your code, you know, it will eliminate dead codes as an example, or it will reduce the overhead you know, by doing so many different things. Um, <clears throat> so you know, compared to eager mode, which you basically use to, to play with PyTorch, you know, to do things locally, to debug it, but then you want to enable this torch.compile in your production you know, uh, level deployment. Okay, um, and, and then anybody heard about the OpenAI Triton? Yeah, we have somebody, cool. 
Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I want to mention it because you know uh, it's the, it is being sort of integrated in the PyTorch uh, big thing. The, it's again OpenAI is the one the company behind ChatGPT, right? Uh, so the Triton project is an open source project. Um, uh, it's provided as part of the PyTorch nightly build, and the Torch inductor that I mentioned it uses OpenAI Triton by default. Okay, and currently the the CUDA, which is from NVIDIA. Uh, the, the, uh, the the development framework for NVIDIA uh, CUDA enabled GPUs, right? And the AMD, AMD GPUs are supported right now, but they're working for more support in the community. So, you know, check it out if you guys are interested in contributing to some open source project. Uh, you know, that's a good one. PyTorch is, of course, the great one I would uh, advocate. And the, Py, the Torch at Compile, it's easy to use. Uh, as I mentioned here, you, all you do is you just you know, again, handle your model to torch.compile and it will take care of things for you, all these optimizations. Or you can use the Python decorators. I just want to quickly mention this, right? So with the GPU cost and, you know, the GPU's availability is not so, not, not so easy these days because of, I think so much of demand. So it's always, you know, and, and it's for it's good for the community for you know everybody right so to have support for multiple GPUs manufacturers right so uh, you know CUDA uh, is from NVIDIA again that and, and it makes life easy to use NVIDIA GPUs but you know AMD GPUs are supported by PyTorch you can use that for your training purpose uh, using their platform Rockam which is similar to CUDA you know from AMD for AMD GPUs Apple so I do on my Mac some of the things. Uh, and then Apple has something called their metal GPUs, and they have their MPS, uh, the metal performance shaders, right? You use that, it's like similar to CUDA, right? But for, for Mac, for Apple. Intel GPUs are supported, uh, and so on. All right, um, contributing to PyTorch. I, I really hope, you know, so some folks will, from here will, will take as in like, okay, I want to do something. Uh, it's, it's always good for the uh, project. But uh, you know there are different projects. So if you go to github.com slash PyTorch, you will see about 69, 70 repos. Slash PyTorch slash PyTorch, that's the core uh, project, right? But then there are like other projects like you know tutorials, examples, Torch, the vision side uh, of the PyTorch, the different libraries. So there are different projects you can contribute anywhere. Uh, there's really you know so always with any project, always refer to the contribution uh, .md file what's the best practices that they recommend, okay? Um, there are two kind of CLAs. So just, I want to share that. So one is you sign the LF easy CLA to contribute to the code project, but then a lot of other projects, they still use meta CLA. So you need to sign that if you want to, you know, contribute to something other than the core project. Always follow code of conduct. And you know, you can contribute into many areas. Right, code, documentations, just reporting issue is good, triaging, you know, they, they can take that help. Any project actually can take that help. Um, and, you know, test coverage and whatnot. The other thing I wanna mention, which is a little bit different I found from other projects is features, right? So typically like in Kubernetes, other projects that I contribute, you basically create an e GitHub issue with your feature requirements and, you know, you, you discuss that, right? And, you know, sometimes you work on the PR PyTorch, I think they have similar thing to what we do, right? CFP, call for proposal in conference, they call call for features. So you basically, you know, submit during that time frame, call for features, you have your features, there is a committee, they look at the features and, you know, they, they work with you just, you know, whether they think that this is really a good addition to the project or should be modified and, you know, resubmit or, you know, that kind of things, right? I provided uh, a link there, you know, as an example, if you wanna take a look uh, for the features that were submitted earlier for 2.3 uh, release. Um, as I mentioned, C++, Python. Python skill is, is I think it's, it, 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 that's good enough, but there are a lot of C++ code as well, mainly for these tensor operations. A lot of C++ if you, you know, dig a little bit deeper. Um, always follow, you know, open source etiquettes. Uh, second thing is getting the help, right? So if you're starting to contribute, where do you get help? I mean, that's very important, you know, uh, to keep that spirit of open source, right? Like, hey, you do have, have to have some help. There are multiple ways, luckily. Um, I mentioned some of them. Uh, they're all available on pytorch.org. I think the best place to get started with a lot of good documentations, a lot of good tutorials, you know. 
Uh, but there are Slack channels for user discussions, questions around you know, using PyTorch around uh, as a developer, like for contributions. Um, and you know, uh, they do office hours every Friday. So it's like one hour office hours, you, know, you, you just basically talk to the real people, right? And ask questions. I'm not going deep into this thing, but you know, we, we have this open source adequates. What are the things that you should be keeping in mind if you want to contribute? My favorite is be nice. You know, if you are be if you are nice, a lot of things will work out. You know, trust me, that's the biggest thing you want to be. I think in real life too. But in open source community, always keep in mind that these people are, you know, a lot of people they're contributing because of the com company wants, or a lot of people contributing because of their passion, right? Helping the open source communities, all that, right? So always be nice, right? I mean, people like sometimes if they have pull requests, somebody don't review in next 24 hours, they're like. Oh, nobody's reviewing my code. No, <laughs> give them a week, right? You know, they, these people have a lot of priorities. So, you know, have, be nice, have some patience, and other things. Um, quickly, uh, these are the things. I'm not going through all of them. Uh, but these are the planned things in the project for the first half of 2024. Okay. So, uh, I mentioned about uh, torch.compile. So, of course, you know, a lot of good performance related uh, improvements has happened. But then usability, right? How do you debug? So there are more work needed there. You know, how do you provide more documentation so people can, you know, uh, understand uh, the, the the feature better? More test coverage always required. So that's one of the focus area. What's this like second thing I mentioned? You know, um, like urgent releases or launches. I mean, that's I think not really needed. Uh, they will be doubling down on the distributed side. I mentioned that's what I wanted to mention it. Uh, observability is another. Uh, another thing, uh, which is again for debugging your, you know, uh, models and uh, training things, um, and you know, I also provided a link if you want to look. Like there are really deep uh, details provided there. Other thing, PyTorch conference is coming up this September. So, you know, if if you can, if you're local to SF area or, uh, you know, you can travel. Highly recommend. A lot of good presentations. I had been to the, the, the first one uh, after the PyTorch Foundation was formed. Great, great uh, place, as always, right? CFEs are due soon, in a month or two months. So I just quickly want to mention, we use PyTorch as part of our Watson X, you know, IBM, and which we have a stack, you know, as you can see, stack of different open source projects. But you can see PyTorch in, you know, for training, inferencing, I provided a couple of links. You can take a picture, right, to, to, to look at the Watson X. We also provide like a free lab. And for learning, as I mentioned, PyTorch.org, one of the best place, right, to get started. Uh, and then PyTorch, the GitHub repo. And um, with that, I mean, you know, we, we had a lot of time. We can do questions here, but I will be here. Sure. And you know, reach out to me, right? Um, we'll be happy to, happy to, you know, discuss more stuff. But yeah, sure. We can open it for question now. Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. And, you know, uh, I mean, I think some of the things I don't know if I, I will be able to tell, but hugging face is, you know, think hugging face as in like a GitHub of open source, right? Like non, non EI stuff, right? So GitHub.com, if you go, you will see millions of projects, right? Not all of them are great. I mean, that's what I think you're, you're worried too. Like, are the models provided on hugging face? Are they always, you know, something you can just get out of box, right? I mean, Hugging Face, I think the com as a company, as much as I know, they do a good job, right? Um, I think ha majority of pro uh, models provided, they are actually PyTorch based. So PyTorch is, I think, uh, probably covers a huge percentage of models which are available. For your specific question, I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, I, the one thing I know this morning, I think Linus mentioned and the discussion trust, right? <laughs> I think I would think about that, right? And and do your own sort of due diligence, you know, like once you get the model, right? Yeah, 
have uh, a few slides about the Catholic Reformation and the influence of the Reformation. So I believe uh, we can say Yeah, you yeah, know that, that's a good question. I think we, as much as I know, not really good job has been done on that aspect. Serializations, you know, uh, somebody was asking me a similar thing. Uh, I'm not here, but maybe a week back we were having some call. Uh, you know, that hey, if you can serialize it, and you know, like right now, <clears throat> as I was saying, that model when you save it, right, it's basically the parameters. So you still, you know, some of the things like you have done, uh, you know, you don't get other than anything, but. The parameters, right? The serialization, I, I mean, that's one good thing. Maybe I can take as a feedback to the project, right? Spec-wise, or well, hopefully, you know, that's something I can even take as a to-do myself, right? And see what 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 can be done there, you know? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Su Susan, uh, we have one more. Can I answer the question? Oh yeah, well, Susan is better answered than yes, please, yes. Which is supported by PyTorch for sure, yeah. Onyx, yeah. yeah. That's a st open. That's a standard, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Onyx project itself. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I check out the Onyx, and it is like it is. It is uh, one of the supported, uh, uh, you know, things by PyTorch. Sorry, uh, we have one more question. Uh, well. And you say NVIDIA and other manufacturer like AMD? All, 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 all NVIDIA, okay. My question is a parallel process thing. One machine with multiple GPUs have what different sizes? Do you think there would be bottlenecks by, say, one just being bigger than another one? Yes. Or of course, yes. Yeah. High sizes? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes, should, yeah. Because it, it will be a bottleneck for sure. Okay. Yeah. Because then you, know, you lose the benefit of your better GPUs, yeah. right? Because the synchronization otherwise won't happen. So. Exactly, yeah, to get the better benefit, yes, of course. Yep. So I think, yeah, I think if I understood, and I let me think this way, if that, that helps you. So something called fine-tuning, I think, is that what you're saying? Like, say, okay, you have model, the base model, as you mentioned, right, which has been trained on, let's say, large data sets. Yeah. Now, you want to use that as a base model and make some top-level developments, yeah. where it's like, hey, I have a domain-specific data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's, I think that's where actually the world is going. Right, I think what's the concession so far is like, hey, not everybody can do those LLMs, right? It's out of question for, for many people, many companies, right? Because of the, the infra requirements, right? Uh, the, so, so I think that's where the world is going. It, it, it is actually real. We are doing it too, you know, at, at, at IBM and I think other companies probably, they are also supporting that. But uh, yes, yeah, so you have like base model on top, you do the, you know, use your limited data sets, fine tune it, that will, you know, not really change the model. It will just fine tune the parameters according to the data, and then you get, you know, what you want.
Yeah, I, I don't think so, no. I think that's basically, you know, I think that, that comes to in picture where, you know, which, which, where'd you get this fine tuned model, right? Right. That's the interchangeable set. Right. But I think, you know, it's like Mover has fine tuned it. I think that's, I don't think within PyTorch itself you can trace back to that level, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what my understanding is, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, you can, uh, of course, yeah. And, and that's what I think the, one of the benefits, as I mentioned, right, because that's where, you know, you, you are training with some larger models because you're using those multiple uh, nodes and something goes wrong, how do you start back from where, is, yeah, so that is supported, yes. I think it's a single file uh, and, you know, with, with basically it has, it has more than just parameters, right, because that's needed, like, like the gradient or the, the uh, some of this optimization that's been going on, right? So it will load all those back, and you can continue your training. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess we are out of time now. Yeah, uh, getting that uh, note from the back. But yeah, I'll be happy to you know, hang out after the talk, and you know we can discuss. I I'm actually available all day now, except Susan's talk, which is at uh, 4:55 end of the day, right here. So yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.